guys, Montel here and welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. I'm coming to you today from the NECAN Cannabis Conference in Boston, Massachusetts. NECAN stands for uh, New England Cannabis Conference and it's one of the largest conferences in the United States for businesses and consumers. Today has been a really good day, big turnout, majority consumers here today. Yesterday was a lot of businesses but more consumers and it's sold out this year completely. I'd like to thank our friends at Eagle Eye Transportation for hosting us and letting us share their booth with them. And I'm very excited about our guest today. He's primary care doctor at Massachusetts General Hospital, an instructor in medicine at Harvard School, and has been a cannabis specialist for over 25 years. His latest book, Seeing Through the Smoke, Cannabis, an Expert, Doctor Untangles the Truth About Cannabis, will be out in April of this year. His family has a long history of the cannabis, and he learned about its benefits from a very early age. Dr. Peter Grinsman, thank you so much for being a part of the show today, sir. Delighted to be here. Absolutely. Let's turn the clock back a little bit and talk a little bit about, you know, your first introduction to cannabis and what was going on in your family at the time that made you aware of even the benefits of cannabis. Well, unfortunately, my brother Danny was fighting a losing battle against childhood leukemia. Oh, my goodness. He was absolutely miserable. He was like 15, 16. I was like seven and eight. And my parents were so desperate, they illegally procured cannabis for him in the, like, 1973, right, when Nixon was starting his war on drugs. Right. And it was just a, amazing to see the difference. When, without cannabis, Danny would be lying in his room with a towel over his head, barfing, losing weight. With a little bit of cannabis, smoked cannabis, he'd be able to eat, maintain his weight, and most importantly to me, play with his little brothers. Sure. You know, it was very interesting, though, when you said it was 1978? 73. Yeah, 73. early, yeah. So we're talking 1973 at a time when, as a nation, and even as a world, was really just getting ready to start looking at cannabis as an efficacious plant, period. It really wasn't until the early 1980s, until the US government started funding a lot of the research in Israel and other places trying to refute the efficaciousness of cannabis, that really the word cannabis kind of came back to the fore. So your family were really, you know, predating everybody when it comes to thinking about cannabis as a medicine. Absolutely, not to mention my dad, Dr. Lester Grinspoon, wrote a book in 1971 called Marijuana Reconsidered, calling for legalization. Uh, at that point, only 12% of Americans supported legalization. It went up about a point for all the 50 years he worked on it. And by the time he passed away about two years ago, about two, two thirds, 69% of Americans support legalization. So he worked Absolutely. on that for half a century. My dad worked on this. Well, you know, it's, it's crazy. I, I, you know, I've always thought myself of being like one of the OGs, but your dad was the true OG. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I started working at this 20 years ago long before it was Vogue, for the same reasons, because understood that, you know, we live in a place and in a country where our own government, through its own research and funding of research, recognized the efficaciousness of cannabis. Most people don't know, this is back in like 1983, 84, 85, 86. And well, let's go back to, you know, uh, uh, Daddy Bush, you know, who started the Compassionate Care Program that was allowing for the University of Mississippi to actually distribute cannabis Back then, a lot of people don't know about that. And you also don't know the fact that our government went ahead and gave themselves a patent on cannabis back as early as night they filed for it in 1999, gave themselves a patent in 2002, and have held on to that patent and extended it a couple of times. Most people don't know that. Yeah, they were certainly doing one thing and saying another thing. You know, they needed cannabis for the war on drugs. Without the cannabis, the war on drugs wouldn't have worked. And you know, I mean, but at the same time, and I'm sorry to, to, to throw it out there this way, they needed to surely maintain cannabis so that they had a re-enslavement tool. I agree. recognize that, you know, our government made cannabis illegal, if you don't know about this, 1937 Marijuana Tax Act had nothing to do with the Illegal Substance Act. It was made by the Tax Act because at that time, the government couldn't figure out how to track the revenue from the seeds across state lines. And so the guy who actually was 
responsible for prohibition leadership, Anslinger, lost his job for alcohol prohibition, got hired on to be the leader in the prohibition of cannabis. A lot of people don't know that. No, absolutely. And, and since then, you look at the numbers of people who have been arrested for cannabis since 1937, 75% of them have been people of color. People don't know that. Who use cannabis at the same rate as people who or, aren't of color. Yeah, <laughs> it, they, or uh, sometimes, if, depending on what study you look at, maybe a little less because the population is so small. But Nixon needed something too, along with the fact that there was this other thing called cocaine that was popping up. They couldn't figure out how to get that into the inner cities because it was too expensive at the time. And they weren't going to arrest a lot of white people for cocaine. So they started, Nixon really set his sights on cannabis, recognizing I could put a lot of black people in jail and continue that nonsense, making and clouding the minds of a lot of politicians to turn against cannabis, not even recognizing its efficaciousness based on what we were finding in studies. You know, God bless them. And, uh, you know, it's so unfortunate that it happened. Uh, but two days ago, we lost Rafael Mishul. And a lot of people don't know that Rafael Mishulam in the mid 80s was receiving funding from the United States government to research cannabis in Israel, identified endocannabinoid system, identified THC, the first person to actually identify THC as a psychotropic portion of cannabinoid, but then understood that this plant had so many more cannabinoids that were of such value. But I still go back to the idea of the fact that your family in the 70s beat all of them to the punch. Well, you know, they were, my dad was an independent thinker. I mean, ironically, he started writing his book, What Are All These Hippies Doing? Smoking Cannabis, They're Gonna Harm Themselves. But he did an independent look at the literature and he concluded that, you know, there are some harms, there are harms to any medicine or drug. Absolutely. But the harms of criminalizing people like so far outweighed the harms of using cannabis that he came up very strongly in, in favor of legalization. And and again, every year, more American, now more Republicans are in favor of legalization than, than aren't. That number, depending on who you read, is anywhere from 69 to 79 percent of the population right now agrees that, number one, at least medical cannabis should be legal. And we're at that 69, 70 percent where people are saying, what's the big deal? And what's really ridiculous is Again, as we look at this rollout across the country, then out of the clear blue, Oklahoma turns it down. It's like, what? You know, why? Where we got Georgia just passed, where we got Mississippi's about to pass, right? Um, it's so strange, but that's because a lot of these legislatures are looking at the opportunity at collecting tax dollars, which is also, you know, one of the biggest impediments to this industry to make it legal. Because right now we know what, 2021, $25 billion worth of cannabis was sold in the United States in the legal market, another 45 to 50 billion in the black and gray market. So making cannabis, honestly, like almost the number two selling product in America. There's also a lot of nonsense going around and it's hard to know, hard to know what's true and what's not true about cannabis. You're a voter in Oklahoma, you hear some doctors saying relatively safe, non-toxic, helpful. Other doctors saying crime goes up, your IQ goes down, your testicles fall off, whatever they say. There's so much conflicting information that's very confusing for people. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you're about, we'll, we'll talk about your new book that's coming out here soon, but you're about making sure that you get the word out to the public and to the, to, you know, the masses that, you know, though there are some things that, you know, cannabis isn't necessarily, you know, the, the end to all for everyone, but cannabis has benefits like any other product. Aspirin has benefits, but aspirin can leave your child dead on the kitchen floor they take too much of it. So the truth of the matter is, we should be doing more research like has already been done. And you know, I, I say this, we should be doing more research. And you know, I'm probably one of the biggest proponents about saying, shut the you know what up and study the research that's already been done. There's been well over 35,000 peer reviewed published documents on cannabis in the last 10 years, 3,500 a year for the last two years alone. There's more published research information on cannabis than any other drug sold in America. Right, but one problem is, during the war on drugs, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, sure. who controlled about 80% of the drug research funding worldwide, yes. they, would not, they would not fund any researchers or studies that were looking for benefits. They would Correct. only study harms. Correct. So we have to sort of interpret the research through the lens of the very sort of racist and discriminatory social, social 
you know, context of the cannabis research. But now in the last two years, though, around the world, because a lot of the rest of the world has decided to throw the finger up in the air at the United <laughs> States and pull out of the 1962 treaty that banned, you know, distribution of hemp and cannabis around the world, because a lot of other countries around the world, Colombia, uh, Chile, uh, Argentina, Israel, Israel, uh, Canada. Isle of Man, Canada, Spain, uh, Germany, India is getting ready to pass a resolution for medical cannabis. So cannabis around the world, and part of the reason why is because, <laughs> excuse me, so many other places around the world recognize that the United States pharmaceutical industry is nothing more than a ripoff, charging exorbitant prices for products that shouldn't be charged that way. And when you look at, in Israel, they look at cannabis as a geriatric drug. Turn 65, you can walk in the hospital and get some. <laughs> because we also recognize the fact that so many people are turning away from other pharmaceuticals in the use of cannabis. So I think, give it another three or four years, the pushback's gonna be enough that who cares what the United States thinks? Yeah, no, I agree. And I'm glad you mentioned geriatrics. I mean, one of the biggest problems with, as people get older, is polypharmacy. They end up on 20 different medications. Correct. But with cannabis, you could treat their pain, you know, CBD, a little bit of THC, their insomnia, their anxiety, their quality of life goes up in every single study. We're starting to see the fact that, and I've infused in my own product line, I'm using CBC using CBD. I want to be able to go and shift over to CBDA soon. We're starting to recognize that as we see some of the viability of other cannabinoids, of which, depending on you read, there's well over 250 of them, we're going to probably find out as we do real serious research like they've begun to, they've begun to do around the world in the last three years, we're going to start to see that we've missed some of the benefits that have been there all along. Well, not only that, during Prohibition, as you know, the economic thing for smugglers to do was to breed up the THC. Oh, and now, was... now we have the luxury of breeding that down a little bit and, and, and focusing on these other medicinal cannabinoids. But that's part of the problem with this industry. <laughs> yes. You know, we take a look at it when you say, you know, some, I guess, you can look at it favorably or disfavorably. It was, I love the fact that Humboldt County and Northern California led the way in the United States for this go round. But they screwed up what was already being led for them out of Kentucky back in the 40s and 50s. Kentucky was growing some of the most, some of the best weed in America, was probably the bigger, the biggest distributors of cannabis in America in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then California takes over and they try to breed all the minor cannabinoids out and push the TAC levels as high as they possibly can. It's smart that there are a lot of cultivators out there that are now recognizing the need for the other minor cannabinoids. But you chase different states and different dispensaries, everybody's out there trying their best to push the highest THC still. Yeah, they, we fetishize high THC. And, yeah. You know, look, high, THC is just one part of cannabis. It's an important Correct. part, but cannabis is a, a very complex um, 400, 500 different molecules. You said Correct. 100, 200 different cannabinoids. We can do better than just 30% THC and nothing else. We can give people more relief. We can give people a better experience with cannabis. It's not all about the THC. No ifs, ands, or buts. That's why I, I developed my own line, and most people know. I got a line out, it's called Inspire. It's a, here in Massachusetts. We're in about 40 dispensaries here. It's a formulation of CBD, THC, and proprietary form, uh, terpenes together in the same cart. I have three of them for four different SKUs. Two of them are CBD, THC. One of them is CBD, CBG, THC. The other one is CBD, THC, CBC, and CBN. What's your favorite of all of them? I use them specifically for different reasons during the day. My higher THC with a little bit of CBD on top, I call that energy. I can get the euphoria that I want, but still stay focused not get jittery, not be all anxious because I've got enough CBD on the top to buffer that down. But then in the middle of the day, in the latter part of the day, I like the combination of all four of those cannabinoids together. If I feel like overhitting that, that can put me to sleep, I call that snooze. So it's an opportunity for you to bring down some of the THC high that you had during the day and also will relax you. However, if you just hit it sparingly, slow as you go, it's a good socialization kind of a combination. 
that, you know, I'm on it right now and I've been using it most of the day, about an hour, every hour I take a hit. Um, my primary one I like the most though is my energy because that keeps me really, 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 really up. It's so funny, doctors are taught about the amotivational syndrome. But if you actually know cannabis users, cannabis, I mean, as my dad used to say, if someone's amotivational, it might make them more amotivational. If they're motivational, it makes them more motivational. And, it's and an enhancer. That's right. And it can really help people focus. And if, the doctors just don't see that. If Albert Einstein did it, <laughs> damn it, who the heck do you think you are telling me that it doesn't work? You know, and then, you know, he... I, Carl I, Sagan. I grew, right. I grew up with Carl Sagan in Correct. our living room. Like, he was not amotivational. I don't know your definition of amotivational, Correct. but he was not amotivational. Correct. Let me just say, I run, I run uh, about seven different businesses right now. Yeah, I'm a motivational. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm a, you know? I'm a physician. I'm, I'm super a motivational too. Gotcha. Yeah, come on. You know, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. I mean, you know, you know, I want to go back for a second because I'm skipping a lot of your background. You did a stint where you worked with Greenpeace, did you not? Yeah, five years. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it was cool. I was, you know, I was just going to do it for a year, then go to medical school. But I was having so much fun. I did it for five years. I went to Chernobyl with a little Geiger counter wow. when we we're opening up an office in Kiev. We stopped the Trident II nuclear missile test by circling submarines over the submarine so it couldn't launch it. Wow. And it was a really fun, great group of people. And I learned a lot about politics, a lot about working together with people, a lot about writing, a lot about the media. And it was just such a pro-social, engaged group of so people. So glad that you, you spent some time at Chernobyl because you would know that. And a lot of our listeners need to understand is that, you know, whether you think it or not, the hemp plant is such an cr incredible plant. And, you know, cannabis, hemp, it's the same plant, just different amounts of THC in which they're one or the other. And that was an arbitrary decision made by someone years ago. But the hemp plant itself, the sativa plant, the cannabis plant, leaches more heavy metals and toxins out of the, out of the soil than anything. We knew this 400 years ago. 400 years ago in America, we used, as a farmer, you used to actually plant hemp plants along with your corn and some of your other plants that you're growing because it helps leach out the bacteria and things out of the soil. There's hemp grown in Chernobyl now that has been there for what, last 15, 20 years? Constantly because they've been trying their best to leach some of those heavy metals and the, the radiation out of soil. Yeah, no, it's really phenomenal for cleaning up the soil, I agree. Absolutely. And you know, so I'm glad that you were able to do a lot of work with Greenspan. Tell me a little bit about your brand new book. The book is called Seeing the Smoke Seeing through the smoke, cannabis, an expert doctor untangles the truth about cannabis. Well, first of all, I explain how we got to have two different views of cannabis. Because gotcha. depending on what doctor, what nurse, what lawyer mm -hmm. you talk to, you'll get, you know, it's a helpful wellness tool. Or you'll get, it's like the devil's lettuce. We have two different, it sounds like two different plants grown on different planets by different suns. Absolutely. And then so I trace how we get that. I talk about the war in cannabis. I talk about what we've done to people, how we've destroyed generations of families. Uh, just by giving people 20 million arrests, it's absolutely crazy. Absolutely, but you know, the thing that's so doc that really just blows me out the water is the fact that, you know, people are looking at, oh, it's so great, we got 39 states in the District of Columbia that have passed medical or recreational cannabis, isn't that great? Yeah, but the same number of people are still getting arrested in the United States of America for possession. Right, exactly. In some of these legal states. And go to Nebraska too, Go to you're California, out of luck. go yeah. to California right now, think you can walk around it drive between one municipality and the next cop pulls you over you got something in your pocket if you don't have it's a recreational state and they're still arresting people yeah no it, and it's still disproportionate racially disproportionate absolutely awful correct you take a look at what just happened a couple of days ago and over the border in mexico you know no one's talking about it they've left this part of the conversation out that family that went across the border in mexico were four black people they went across the border and the cartel thought because they were black, they had to be Jamaican drug smugglers that were competing with them for either cocaine or fentanyl. That's why they shot them. Are you kidding me? We've now exported around the world. Be careful, black people are, are dragging drugs. Stop! Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. It um, I also in the book talk about doctors and how mm -hmm. doctors went from being big proponents of cannabis. They We prescribed it in the 1800s, early 1900s all the time. And then and you could go right back just to, to confirming what the doctor said go to any library near you look at some 1890 newspapers flip to the back to the classified section and you'll find probably 20 to 30 different formulations of cannabinoid cannabis tinctures and things in medicine back then this is 1890 yeah. folks the reason why is because remember we just finished something called a civil war hmm civil war 
battle between the North and the South. Guess what? The only thing the battle between the North and the South had in common was that they were all clothed in hemp fiber. When the war was over, the North and the South guys who had their legs blown off, their arms blown off, we had more wounded people in America during that period of time than ever before and ever since. And all of them were trying to seek medication to help them. They had a choice. They could have gone to the opioid, opioid den. No. Why were they all making tinctures out of cannabis? You know, when you look at the paper, you didn't see a whole bunch of opioid. You did see some. There were some. You know, what they used to call them? Um, wasn't just opioid dens. Uh, it was a title that they had for them during the turn of the century. And I can't remember. Sorry. Somebody will correct me. But back then, you had an opportunity to go to a den, lay around, because they used to blame it on those Chinese people <laughs> that brought it into the country, or you could actually seek out some medication. There are so many tinctures, so many formulations of medications around cannabis at the turn of the century, leading up to the time that we vilified it and made it illegal. And when we vilified it and made it illegal, the people testifying against making it illegal was the American Medical Association. But then how about bill passed in 1937, I think it was 1940 or, no, 1939, 1940. Back then, De La Guardia, who was the mayor of New York, actually commissioned a study among doctors. Some, a couple hundred doctors signed on to a petition back in 1939, 1940, claiming that the, making cannabis illegal was the most egregious medical mistake that the medical community had made in America. Uh, that commission, no, it was 1939. Exactly. And that, also, that commission also said it doesn't cause people to be violent. It doesn't cause homicide. It doesn't lead to opiate addiction. It really undid a lot of the myths that Anselinger was trying to bludgeon people Absolutely. with. Absolutely. It it's not going to make your wife, if she's white, go out and have sex with a black man. Because that's some, another thing that Anselinger said. Right. And it's not going to make a black man want to step on a white man's shadow. Not going to happen. These are the words that came out of this man's mouth. It, These had, are the, it had nothing to do with health and safety, correct. making cannabis illegal. But then over the next generation or two, doctors like flip sides. They went from being proponents of cannabis to being on the wrong side of the war on drugs. That's right. And because medical schools stopped teaching it. Now, at least around the country, it's starting to spot, spottedly, spottedly, that's not a real word. It's, it's starting to, to turn up in different universities all over the country. I think George Washington University has now a, a, a pathway to learn about cannabis. I think um, George Washington, I think Washington University, University of Maryland has UVM, had a program for a long time. University of Vermont Medical yes, School. Yep, has they've, had, they've had a program for a long time. Harvard is now teaching. I was just at MIT uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they are starting a whole new study. They just funded a study on cannabinoids and its effect on PTSD which is a whole yep. nother conversation. So now all of a sudden, what, what I, I have so many things I can talk to you about. Does it not shock you the fact that these same doctors who were haters for the last 30 years now all of a sudden realize there might be some money in this. <laughs> so let me see if I can make a dollar. I believe, I believe, I, I feel like reaching across the table smack and half of them to do that. I'm sorry. Well, as my dad said, the doctors have been both victims of and perpetrators of the, all the nonsense, all the misinformation from the U.S. government. And it's really amazing that patients are, are leading and doctors are following. Like 94% of Americans support legal access to medical marijuana. The doctors are following the patients. Well, but you know what? What's interesting is weird is that's, that's one of the things that I push back against our own industry for. We are probably the best at B2B, business to business information. I've been sitting here in this booth you know, I'm here at a booth at the NECAM, which is the New England Cannabis Conference here in Boston, Massachusetts. We're having this interview right here. I've been standing at a desk here, and, you know, I'm going to say this is Saturday. They told me that yesterday was more of a B2B, but I've probably had conversations with at least 40% of the people who've stepped up are in the business of cannabis. And again, we do a great job that way, but we do probably one of the most piss poor jobs, B2C business to consumer. Now, there are a lot of consumers walking around here, but today we put on, and I'm not knocking it. This is not a knock. I'm, in fact, I'm talking to Jim tomorrow. Jim Belushi is going to be on our podcast tomorrow right here from the NECAM floor. Jim had the keynote speech today. I sat through it. I was listening to it. Jim was in a room full of the choir. And really, the choir didn't have any questions for him other than you know, how's business? 
Okay, that's good. But why aren't we having four or five different conferences all throughout the day here at NECAN talking about the viability of some of the studies that have come out in the last four or five years? Skip the 30,000 that don't matter. Let's jump to just last year alone. Start in January of last year, a study came out of Australia that has now been revalidated and expanded upon. A study came out of Australia, and I'm so sorry I don't have the exact same study name, but you can look it up. Just look up uh, Australian study on pancreatic cancer, it will come up. There were breakthroughs that have now proven that when you were talking earlier, you know, we pushed the THC up. We don't even understand the value of what THC can really do. So you don't have to have THC at the 30, 40, 50% mark, 95%. Stop that stupid. If you have enough THC, equal parts that are nanoparticleized and put in the body, we do know that the other monocannabinoids, especially the acid forms, help them to permeate the cells even better. So there's some interesting thing going on with pancreatic cancer and THC with CBG and CBD together that is blocking the pancreatic cancer from having the ability to grasp onto a blood source. Yeah, it kills the blood cells, it kills the blood vessels, it stops well, just kills the cells. Scream at doctor! Scream it! Tell them, tell them But these are the studies that weren't funded by the U.S. government. Only studies into harm for the last 50 years were funded. Now we're starting to look. In cells, all kinds of cannabinoids, CBC, CBN, CBG, CBC, they all and, kill cancer cells. And we all the acid In humans. Yeah. It's incredible. This is the kind of information on that. Again, I am not knocking. Don't write me no email telling me, Montel, you picking on Nikkei. I ain't picking on nobody. I'm just saying... If we're going to get this many people together, and I'm looking around this room, and there's a flow. I'm telling you, there's been a flow. This is probably going to be, by the end of the day, I bet you they have 20,000 people roll through here. You know? And if 20,000 people roll through here, a lot of these people are kind of curious. They are looky-loos. They're walking through, trying to, they're just over it. They're inundated because when they look around, they see everything from security sources to lighting to dab extract. Blah, 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 blah. But we ought to take advantage of giving these people, I don't care if you give them free coffee if they walk in the door, but let's start educating these folks. What does Big Pharma do all day long? When you sit in your living room, you look at a television screen, every 15 minutes, the commercial that comes on is about some new drug that they're trying to not educate doctors on, they're educating the consumer on. So they ask their doctor. So the doc, they walk in and ask the doctor. Come and then on, the doctor now. says, well, doc oh, I happen to have use a this other medication that your insurance actually pays for. <laughs> I, or, or the doctor says, I happen to have some samples right here. Right. Because, you know, they're paying me about 1500 bucks a month. To do this. Come on. I mean, it's, it's about time, though. And I think that that's what will make this industry absolutely refocus itself and hit the level that we should hit. And it's when... We as an industry stop fighting with each other. There's enough. We're we are the right brothers pushing the daggone wooden plane down a hill right now. We have not gotten any further than that. And it's about time that we start thinking about there might be jet engines coming. And if we looked at it together, the only way that the right brothers, they never created their own airline. Okay, let's remember that. They just pushed a little wooden thing down a hill. Somebody else stepped in, big pharma, big business came in made the planes that people that take people in the air. We need to do the same thing in this industry. We need to come together. We don't need a pharmaceutical company to come in, a multi-state operator to come in, take us over. If we just kind of, like right now, I'm partnering up with, you know, Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye is gonna be, is one of my, is my distributor. These guys are actually moving the products around for me. I'm in 40 dispensaries up here. I decided to partner with a contract manufacturer in, uh, uh, our guys who make the freshly baked products. Freshly baked has been in the state of Massachusetts for five years. They sell probably the number one, number two gummy in the state at any given moment. Why do I have to reinvent the wheel? I reached out to somebody who's proven, you know, they know what they're doing. They have really good, good, good feedstock that I can choose from. And we then formulate the product together. I'm the formulator. They are actually manufacturing it and I distribute it. And if there were more and more companies that decided to work together, that that forces the two of us to then have to go out and find a distributor that we work together with. We all have a common goal. Of course, we want to make 
this thing blow up and make our companies and brand do well. But at the same time, if we work together, the message gets out to more and more people rather than turning my back on my brother or turning my back on another brother. Well, absolutely. There is sort of a fight for the identity of the cannabis industry. You know, yes. you've got these pro-social people who have been involved in the legalization, the yep. legacy growers. Yep. Then you have these people migrating in from tobacco, from alcohol, oh my God. from pharma, who aren't particularly pro-social. They just want to make money. And they and lie. They, and they lie. They act like they, they, they believe in the product and they don't. They talk about wellness in these right. vague terms, but you can tell they know it's not from the heart. It's just like uh, marketing. Tell me about wellness when you're still extracting using butane. Right, exactly. <laughs> tell me about wellness when you every product that you put out has got 45 milligrams of sugar in it. Sorry, I ain't buying it. You know what I mean? I think it's about time that we decide that it, we don't have to police ourselves, but we need to like start checking ourselves. So how do you fix that David versus Goliath thing? Like these companies are huge. How, how does the little guy protect himself? When we, if you reach way back before this became a big guy industry, there were times 10, 15 years ago when brands literally came together. We stopped. But now we realize how fragmented this is. You look at a state like Massachusetts that is now inundated. They are still giving out more and more licenses. I ain't making it better. Let's not making it better. It's time that we, as an industry, I say, whoa, slow down here a second. Give it a couple of years to breathe before you decide to give out another 60 licenses. So what are we doing? We're spreading it out and spreading it so thin that nobody can actually make any money. And, you know, I keep my eye on Big Pharma because there may be a reason why they're doing it that way. And then, so you got people fighting over, oh, I want a formulation with the highest THC so I can suck in all the kids. Well, guess what? Last time I looked, a lot of kids in America don't have any money. <laughs> it's the baby boomers who have the money. And the baby boomers who are looking for products that can help get them and move them away from those 30, 40 pharmaceuticals that they've been prescribed. They have the disposable income. So why aren't we making more products for them? And understanding that it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of the baby boomers don't want to be blown out. They don't want to sit down and smoke a pre-roll that I'm going to be vezzed out on the couch and can't move from. There's a no. lot of baby boomers that come back to cannabis and they take the three bong heads that they took 20 years ago and they don't realize that it's like five times stronger. Absolutely. And then they like overconsume. Like I've had family members, I'm like on the sofa, like you're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not dying. I don't have to take you to the hospital. Absolutely. Well, look, tell me a little bit more about just, just if you had to put on the crystal ball, where do you think we're going to be as an industry in, let's say, the next five years? Well, I think it's a fight, a fight for the identity of the industry, the MSO, the big companies, pharma, you know, pharma's strategy was to keep cannabis illegal so that they could make their own expensive cannabinoids and people had to buy it. Absolutely. They lost. We're legalizing. Now they're taking a, we can't beat it, beat them, join them attitude. And they're really sort of working with tobacco and alcohol. And it really is David versus Goliath. And I'm obviously on um, the side of uh, the little guy. And I think that the most important thing is equity and having like small companies and and having family businesses and not having like two or three massive brands that wipe out right. uh, all the other little guys. So I think it's really a, a fight right now for the identity of the cannabis industry. Yeah, you, you, you wrote about a few specifics in your book about how some of the cannabis companies are spending money uh, deliberately to thwart the efforts of, not cannabis companies, some of the pharmaceutical companies are spending a lot of money to thwart the efforts of the cannabis company, right? Give a couple of examples. Oh yeah, well, exa well, I hate it when the cannabis companies argue against homegrown. Yes. Who argues against homegrown? What is like, what is the rationale for arguing against homegrown except that you want to sell more? Right. Uh, so I think that's a really, a really good example. And, and also just, you know, there was a, the company in um, Insys, uh, they also got in trouble for like marketing fentanyl lollipops to kids. But they were literally arguing against legalization. They get $500,000 against legalization in Arizona while they were developing their own cannabinoid so that you get arrested if you use cannabis, yet if you want relief from cannabinoids, you had to buy their expensive product through your doctor and through the health, the pharmaceutical industry. That's unethical. Right, absolutely. And I mean, more and more people need to be made aware of that. And that's where, again, I, I don't cast dispersions against our industry, but this is where we ought to be coming together to get that word out so that the public understands. That's that B2C thing. Well, we need to reward pro-social behavior and we need to punish like predatory behavior. And you know, as a doctor, I can't have you here and not talk about the fact that though we're in an industry where we support cannabis use, all cannabis use isn't perfect, right? 
oh no, there are harms to anything. But you know what the problem is? Uh -huh. There are harms to cannabis just like there are to any other drug or medicine. But no cannabis proponents believe the harms because the US government has lied about it and exaggerated for the past 50 years. So right. part of what my book does is say, what it, what is harmful, what isn't harmful, and if you like it, how do you use it safely? I'm all about harm reduction. Right, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about how do you use it safely? Well, you know, uh, for example, when I was in high school or even junior high school, we used to smoke, we'd take That's a right. puff and hold it in for 10 minutes yep. and, you know, I'm holding it. And then actually the studies have shown that you like you just have to hold it in for a second or two right. to get the THC. Correct. So like that just irritates your lungs. You could use a dryer vaporizer. I mean, if you smoke once a week at a party, who cares if you're smoking? But if you smoke, like if you need it all every day, you should be using a dryer vaporizer. You shouldn't be smoking it. It's not as good for your lungs. And right. again, it's all about using, not fetishizing, fetishizing high THC, but using a mixture of lower THC and uh, more medicinal cannabinoids. How do you feel about edibles? Uh, well, edibles are a great tool. If you have chronic pain, if you smoke, you just it just works for two hours. And edibles right. can give you relief for like eight hours. Sure. As long as you don't take too big a dose of the edible, I you don't make the rookie slow, mistake. Yeah. Slow as you go. Yeah, make but sure edibles are great as long as you don't overdo it. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, <laughs> I think back uh, 20 years ago, uh, yeah, 20 years ago, I literally was making edibles in my own kitchen in Manhattan. And, um, you know, I, I, I almost, I didn't turn away from, but, you know, I got out of the flour consumption back in 2001. I literally shifted over, started consuming mostly keef and mostly keef based extracts. And so I was taking keef and literally turning that into my cannabis butter. And I was doing it old school ways. Old school way, literally, I could either take, you know, oh man, about a half ounce, ounce of keef, put it into a saucepan, put a, you know, oh, about three tablespoons of butter in there, let it simmer. I barely, I'm telling you, on 140 degree heat for about five hours. Really? Oh yeah. I would do it and then, you know, you, if you came into my apartment building, it smells. I, was on, I was on the 13th floor, you smell it in the lobby. So nobody's trying to, everybody's trying to figure out where it's coming from. I never told them, my tells were. So then I would take that oil or that butter and use that as my liquid mixture in, I used to have these poppy seed, you know, little cupcakes that I used to make. And um, I'll never forget, I used to play in a band and I was making these little single serving poppy seed cupcakes that for me, and I was a, I'm, I've always been a big consumer. So a half of one of those cupcakes was perfect. You know what I mean? Take a half, wait an hour, got a rock and buzz, but go ahead and eat the second half at the end of that hour and it'll last for six, seven hours. I could go out with friends who were pounding back four or five drinks. I didn't have to have a drink, nothing, you know what I mean? So I had, I had a, uh, band practice one day and I came to band practice and I knew a couple of my brand mates consumed and I was like, you know, did I did make these brownies but make sure slow as you go, only eat a half, <laughs> don't eat a whole, eat a half, wait an hour, eat another half. The band mates that I was talking to recognized that. I didn't realize there was somebody over my shoulder sitting at a table that was listening in on the conversation. So I gave the two band mates and I put the rest of them in my pocket of my jacket, hung it up, went out to practice and we're rehearsing. Then all of a sudden, you know, uh, we're in like the second song and my drummer starts like, I'm telling you, -ta 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 he starts speeding up every song. We're like, dude, slow down, stop, slow down. And he's like, I looked at him and he's like, whoo, whoo, he's shaking his head right forward. And I walked over to him and I said, dude, did you eat one of my brownies <laughs> or one of my cupcakes? He said, yeah, man, I'm sorry, I had two. Uh, I said, you had what? <laughs> I had two, and I'm telling you, this is back predating regular testing, but I guarantee you that those little teeny tiny cupcakes that I made, easily 140 milligrams, easily 140. So humbly ate two of them in one setting, about 300 or about 280 milligrams in his system. He literally, I, we had to stop practice because by the time that it really hit him, he was close to hallucinating sitting behind yeah, the drum that's set. That's not always fun either. That's not fun yeah, at all. No, seriously. So he's driving home, or well, my guys were driving him home because they had to leave his car at the studio. He starts crying. 
Y'all gave me heroin. <laughs> I'm going to die. You're not going to die. He calls his mother. His mother said, take him to the hospital right now. So, you know, the guys were like, I, he didn't have any heroin. He had cannabis. Take him to the hospital right now. So they took him to, I won't give out the hospital name, Upper West Side in, in uh, New York. They took him to the hospital. And the guy, one of the bandmates walked in with him, saw the emergency room doctor. And the doctor said, what's the problem? And he, this, the, now the drummer's like, like passed out to the point that they had to carry him in, basically. And uh, the, the doctor said, they said, look, man, this guy's mother told us we had to bring him here. We couldn't bring him home when she was going to call the police. He said, what's the problem? He said, well, he just ate some cannabis brownies. The guy said, get his mother on the phone. <laughs> emergency room doctor got the mother on the phone. He said, let me tell you something. You got a choice. If your son stays here for three more minutes, the meter starts. It starts at $1,700. You're in the emergency room. Or you can just go home, lay down, go to sleep, and talk about it tomorrow morning. She said, get his ass out of there right now. <laughs> they said, oh, yeah. No, so, but, I mean, but you feel make, really bad. Absolutely. I mean, you, know, you don't want to overconsume. That's no, why. That's what the prohibitionists say. People use more and more and more. But the that's fact is, people become educated and they titrate to their own level of comfort. Correct. And that's what. That's another reason why I designed the product line that I did. It allows you to do that. It allows you to titrate to your own level just by inhalations. But you don't have to take big ones. Just take a small one. Start the off brownie small. batter can get people. You're making brownies. They keep eating the batter. I've seen some people Correct. overconsume. And not realize that they're... Yeah, it tastes they, good. Yeah, it of tastes course like it brownie does. batter. Absolutely. And now we're coming up with so many... You know, water soluble extracts that can be mixed in anything. Well, it's kind of tough, so that's great. So, now, do, are there any studies that have happened in the last few years, like we were just talking about, that really excite you? Uh, yeah, there are tons of studies that really excite me. Um, I think what really excites me the most is that, that we're winning over the medical community. The medical community is finally, there's so many studies. There are 4,200 studies in the year 2022. Um, and now the studies are not just demonizing ca cannabis, so they're harm and benefit. And I think that, that like your average doctor is starting to under listen to their patients, see the benefit, understand the harm, but I, we're winning back the medical profession. Absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, I think the medical profession right now needs to just recognize, I get what is called an anecdote. Well, that's one or two people. That's an anecdote. When it's five or six hundred, Something wrong with you think that's an anecdote. Well, try 10 million people using it for chronic pain. Sure, Why sure. Why would they be using it for chronic pain instead of opiates? Correct. Unless it works. Correct. And then, you know, of course, you get the science. Well, it really doesn't work on the pain receptors. That's not what it's all about. Well, it does work in the pain receptors, too. Correct. Absolutely. And the more we learn. And it also makes it so the pain doesn't bother you. You feel the pain, right. but you feel better. That's right. It, it kind of, it, I, I often talk to people, I say, you know, you know, I've used cannabis now for 22 years for pain. Does it completely alleviate my no. pain? Now, recently, I did find a phenotype that was really bizarre. Because I'm telling you, it knocked me on my knees, not from too big of a euphoria. I took it, somebody said, look, I'm telling you something. I've never tried something that literally gets rid of the pain, but your pain goes away. You just don't separate from it. I was like, yeah, whatever. I took maybe three hits off of a pre-roll of this particular phenotype. And I'm going to tell you something. For the first time in 20 years, I got real pain relief from cannabis. Why don't you use that phenotype in one of your products? I'm trying to. As a matter of fact, we're trying to get it right now. I'm going to try to see if I can get a farmer to grow it out. Because that's a me. big deal. Absolutely. It's a really big deal. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and you know, I, I've actually told others who I know kind of suffer from similar kind of pain that I have. And they've come back with the same answer. Absolutely. I don't want to give it up. If you want to find your book, where would they go? Oh, you can go to Amazon or any of the book, you know, you can go to like any of the bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, any of the online stores. When it comes out on 420, it's going to be at every bookstore. But for right now, you can find it online. Coming and out it, in about five weeks. And again, the name is seen that through the smoke, cannabis, an expert doctor entangles the truth about cannabis. Let's go back one more time before we stop. And, you know, again, You've got to be excited about just what's happening in the industry in the sense that at least more doctors are starting to recognize and not immediately go poo-poo. Absolutely. Well, I want doctors to become more educated about this, uh -huh. but I also want people on both sides to become more educated. The, the anti-people have to understand that it helps people, and the pro-people have to understand that there are safer and less, ways, less safe ways to use it. And I think with some humility on both sides, we could all really come together and there's no reason to have two warring camps about cannabis. It's one plant with certain characteristics. And 
I'm hoping to come up with like a middle ground that we could all agree upon. Absolutely. Well, sir, anything else you want to add? No, just that it's a pleasure. Thank you for all your advocacy. Absolutely. No, thank you. And if people wanted to reach out to you, where would they go? Uh, they go to my website, uh, www.petergrinspoon, grin like smile, spoon like fork, www.petergrinspoon.com. Happy to answer questions. You can find my book. You can see talks. You can do all kinds of things. See my events that are coming up. Got any? Go ahead and do a shout out for an event. Uh, Brookline Booksmith. Uh, April 18th and May 17th, Harvard Bookstore. A okay. couple of fun events. Super, super. Book signing, you'll sign your book? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You want to make sure you go out and get that. And I got to thank you so much for being a part of the show today. And thank you guys for listening in and tuning in. Again, I'm coming to you from the New England Cannabis Conference. And uh, today is the second day. There's another day, so if you happen to hear this, there's another day, Sunday. Third day is the second day. Third day is Sunday. And uh, I think Sunday will probably be a good mix of consumers and business people also. And you got... There's enough. I'm in. I'm in booth number 200. Come on now. So there's a lot of booths there. So and a lot of information being uh, just given out. So come on by. I want to thank you all for tuning in to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thank you, sir. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also. So please send us your comments.